All right, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 16, uh, continuing uh, Simon Peter, and tonight we're looking at the uh, rock uh, that Jesus would call him. And um, but also not only the rock, uh, but how we can be um, a rock in somebody's life one minute, but the very next moment, sometimes we can be a stumbling block. And, uh, you know, that's what uh, is interesting as we look at Peter's life. Um, it. It goes through sometimes a high and it goes through a low. And sometimes that high and low happens almost within um, a few moments of each other. And I, I love to see that because it shows that we're not far from sometimes making a decision that we're not proud of. Scripture tells us, by the grace of God, there go I. And I've always appreciated that, that it's by God's grace of what we do. Uh, God gives us the ability to do what we do. God gives us the wisdom. Uh, God gives us the strength. And um, because when we lean to, that's the reason why Scripture tells us to lean not to our own understanding, because when we lean to our own understanding, when we lean to our own ways, it's uh, detrimental to our faith and it's detrimental to our uh, the plans in which God would have for us. Um, but uh, we're, what we're going to see is Simon Peter's uh, confession of faith here. Uh, we have in Matthew 16, and we'll pick up in uh, 13, uh, it says that now when Jesus came into uh, the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they say, said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Now, to stop right there for just a moment, imagine you're in this setting, or just imagine for your, for your own sake, without answering maybe what Peter's answer would be. Just think for, the, for a moment. Who do you say that Jesus is? Son of God? Savior? Redeemer? Messiah? A friend? Absolutely. He is a friend. Anyone else? What do, who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say? Um, I like that because the point that Jesus is making here, uh, even before anything else, he says, uh, because uh, who, do pe who do people say that I, uh, the Son of Man is? Yeah, he is. Yeah. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and I didn't want to go there. So I wanted to stay. But then when I started to grow, I understood I needed a Lord. Mm-hmm. And the old adage, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. It really brings the truth. Uh, because when we say Lord, And that is important to note because he is he is Lord, um, and all of the answers, and that's the thing, all of the answers are correct. He is Messiah. He is a friend. He is a savior. He is as you go through all of those things, it it, it is correct, and um, the the fact that you can say. Uh, that more than one thing can be uh, right at the same time, uh, but in His authority and in who He is, He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And um, when you look at who He is, uh, this is important because what comes into being here is He says, who do men say that I am? The first question to the disciples is, who does everybody else say that I am? And he doesn't ask him immediately, who, who do you say that I am? He says, who does everybody else say that I am? What's, people, what's, people, what's the talk on the street about me? What's everybody else saying? And they, they immediately answer, well, as some people say, say that you're John the Baptist. Well, first of all, I've always thought that answer was very strange that some would say he's John the Baptist, even though John the Baptist would, would lose his life, has lost his life. They both lived at the same time as each other. I mean, they, uh, John the Baptist baptized Jesus. So that answer has always been strange to me that some people would say you're John the Baptist. So it's just, to me, uh, kind of a strange answer. Uh, but others say you're Elijah. Now that, to me, could be a, a, an answer that would seem more feasible. Uh, how did Elijah leave this world? Yeah, he, I mean, this, uh, this chariot of fire comes down and swoops him out of this world. Now all of a sudden this man comes, Jesus, doing miracles like Elijah did. And so some people are saying, hey, that guy's Elijah. He, he's come back, and that's Elijah walking around in the flesh again. I mean, so that answer has always seemed a little more feasible to me that as people are watching Jesus go around, it seems a little more understandable. And he said, others, they think you're, you're Jeremiah. Maybe that's because Jesus looked out on things and He wept. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. And he lamented over lamentations. He lamented over the sins of the people. He, I, I don't know why they would compare him to Jeremiah, but some thought he was Jeremiah. Others thought he was just one of the prophets. We don't know which one he is, but he's, he's obviously a prophet because he knows a lot of stuff. He really knows the, the he knows the scriptures. He knows he knows things that we don't know anything about. He's got to be somebody from God, one of the prophets. I don't know which one it is. He's got to be somebody important. And Jesus goes, "Well, that's all fine to hear what everybody else thinks. But you you've walked with me. You've been here." walking and hearing and seeing who do you say that I am? And I, I, I look at this in Simon Peter's answer, you are the Christ. And, and, and John, said, John said the Son of God a while ago. Uh, that he said, uh, you are the Christ, 
the Son of the living God. Now, this is important. What Jess said was that he's Lord. They're in Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is built up as a beautiful place. It is also built with enormous, beautiful shrines to other gods surrounding them. There are all of these places built for idol worship and all of the things for people to spend their time worshiping false gods. So they're here in this countryside and they're looking and they see all of these shrines to so many other gods. And Peter's answer is, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I love that part because he says, the Son of what? The living God. All of these shrines surrounding them, none of those gods alive, they're all built out of some material. While physical in nature that you can see it, none of those gods alive. He said, you are the son of the living God. That to me is the most miraculous of testimonies of things that could possibly be given out of the mouth of an individual. And for Jesus, when Jesus answers back to him, Jesus says this uh, amazing thing. He says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of Jonah. He says, uh, he says, blessed are you. He says, for what? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Can I remind you of something? When you do something good... It wasn't you. <laughs> Jesus, yeah, Jesus kind of knocks the way. Finally, Peter, you've done something good. Something good has finally come out of that mouth of yours. Uh, you have made testimony to the witness of who I am. And you have said something that is powerful. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Bless you, Peter. Bless you. But I'm going to tell you something. Flesh and blood didn't give that to you. Peter, that did not come from you. When we do something for the cause of Christ, when we do something for God, it is our willingness to do it but it is never our special ability or because we are so gifted. Our gifts, our talents, our abilities all come from the Lord. What God has gifted us, what God has granted us, those that we use for Him, that's why when we look at Him, all glory goes to God. That when we do something, it is... It's not that flesh and blood has given me this great ability, but God who is in heaven has gifted me and allowed me to do this for Him at this particular moment. And that's what Jesus tells him. He says, Simon Barjona, He says, bless you, but it wasn't you. It wasn't your flesh. It wasn't your blood. He said, it wasn't that gifted mind of yours. But He said, it was what? He said, it was my Father who is in heaven. He said, where did it come from? My Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, he says, I tell you, you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, some important statements were made there, and I want you to carefully look over what was just stated. 
uh, because some strong doctrines are taken from that uh, based on what Jesus just spoke there uh, in many churches. But I want you to look at that and I want you to think on what would Jesus just said. Jesus just told Simon a couple things. He said, first of all, what? He said, when your flesh and blood that revealed this to you, but who? My Father which is in heaven. Then he looks at him and he says that you are Peter. He says, and you're this rock. And he says, I'm going to build my church on, on, on you. Is that what he's saying? The gates of hell are not going to prevail, prevail against it. Whatever you do, Peter, he said, it's going to... A lot of doctrine is built on this in a lot of different places, a lot of teaching. So now I want to ask you, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put, it, put it in your court for just a moment and ask you, what is Jesus saying here in this moment to Peter? There we go. Jesus had already made the pronouncement that flesh and blood did not reveal this. In other words, we're not capable. Is Peter going to do some remarkable things for the church? Absolutely. But the church was never founded upon Peter. It was never built around Peter and upon Peter. He is going to stand and he's going to preach on Pentecost when he's filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And he is going to see thousands and thousands of people saved. But that isn't because what Jesus said here that I'm building my church on you, Peter, because you're a rock. It's the confession at what Jeff just said, it's the confession that Peter just made that one, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know that the church has never been built on me or you or any one of us. Tomorrow, one of us might get mad and storm out of the church because... Somebody hurt our feelings or something happened to us or we just may, for whatever reason, something happens in our life that we completely walk out of here. We say, well, I'm done. They say, oh, I'd never do that. Well, Peter said he'd never do that too. I'll never forsake you. I go to the death with you, Jesus. It can happen. See, the church isn't built on us. See, the church keeps going, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, regardless of what you and I do. The moment that we think the church revolves around you or I is the moment that we've got the whole picture backwards. It don't revolve around me and it doesn't revolve around you. It revolves around one. He says, here, you are who? Talk, when he speaks of Jesus, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It revolves around one. It doesn't revolve around me. It doesn't revolve around you. And the moment that we can set aside everything else and identify that it's all about Him and it's not about us, that is what brings the church to a point that it can truly get on track not only for worship, but on track to seeing more and more people coming to know Him. Why? Because He says, even though He was speaking that if salvation-wise, that 
he would be sacrificed for the crucifixion, but it truly means, even in another context, that if he should be lifted up, he said, if I should be lifted up, I will draw all to me. What If Jesus is lifted up, he would draw all men to him. People are drawn to Christ when he is lifted up. Not when Peter's lifted up in this context. So Peter here, he is a rock. His very name is a rock. You and I, we can be a rock in the sense of we can be a good foundation in the church. The ultimate foundation is Jesus. But we can be what we need to be professing who Jesus is. But what we see here, he professes who Jesus is. Uh, he does get to the point of that moment, but what happens beyond this? Jesus shifts gears. And in the next few verses, from that time, Jesus began to, well, let's back up to verse 20. He strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Why did he do that? It wasn't time. Tell no one. I just asked you, who do men say I am? And then I asked you, who do you say I am? You just heard Peter confess. And I said it came from my Father which is in heaven. But don't tell nobody. Has anybody ever thought that I, I just don't understand why God does what He does or the timing of why God is doing what He's doing when He's doing it? Exactly. Has anybody never thought that? I mean, one of the things that I have realized is I get in an awful big hurry for a lot of things. I always think I've got to, I've got to do this. I'm always rushing. And the thing that I, I've, I have to remember is God never rushes for anything. God, it's not like God's in a hurry. Now, the difference between me and God is God knows exactly when everything's going to happen. He's had it planned for a long, long time. And I'm always like, okay, got this, got this. Okay, well, we've got to hurry up and get this. And everything in God's agenda is appointed. It's even appointed unto man wants to die. It's just happens. It's not like God's sitting there just, oh, well, I've got to hurry up and get this done today. It's all laid out from beginning to end. I'm Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. And God doesn't get in a hurry. It tells us that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I, I, it's hard to do because we don't like to wait on the Lord. And I, I see that God's plan and God's timing here, He strictly charges the disciples to tell no one. Now, to me, that wouldn't make sense. And some of us wouldn't know how to keep a secret if, if even Jesus told us to keep the secret. I mean, Jesus is sitting there and He says, now don't tell nobody. Maybe that would be a good way for us to start witnessing if next Sunday I told everybody, I say, now don't go out of here and tell nobody about Jesus. But Yes. And, and that is where we're getting it because even the disciples at this point and that's where we get to in the next context. Because, yeah. 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 
One is access. Yes. But another is uh, authority. Yes. I mean, there are two people in this room tonight have keys to my house. It's our house. Mm -hmm. and, and, and everybody else doesn't have a key to that house. When I work for a the car company, I had a set of keys that they had entrusted. Yes. I could get in to certain buildings or to certain areas where someone who was not an employee couldn't get in. So I had some authority. I had access authority. Then he said, I'm going to give you this access or this authority. Whatever you find on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose will be loose. I always really try to understand what he's saying there. Uh, I don't know that I have a proper understanding of it. Uh, but again, going back to the idea of authority, mm -hmm. in the church there is some authority. Yes. Some things that are allowed and some things that are not permitted. Now, sometimes society can real upset with the church and wants to tell the church how the church ought to behave. When they don't have the authority or the access. Well, you know, well the church doesn't have no right to say that. To do that. You ever hear somebody say yes. you know, church makes a decision to fight whether it's the county going wet or whatever it might be. But who does the church make that in? Mm -hmm. Well, right here, they've been given authority that within their body, they make the rules. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time, uh, Lamar used to miss as he had a trade, and somebody was arguing about uh, church membership. And it wasn't fair to ask somebody to do something that was on the page. So the Jesus began that whole thing with telling him initially that it was, of course, I tell you that on this rock I will build my church. And then I always, even backing up to, he says that on the church, he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What I was saying there a few moments ago, uh, the church doesn't revolve around an individual that no matter what happens, the gates of hell have not prevailed against the church. There is an enemy to the church, no doubt about it. Um, the enemy um, wants to destroy the church. Well, Jesus made a promise here. He says the gates of hell uh, shall not prevail against the church. But here's the thing about it. The enemy may want to destroy the church, but the thing that I've always found interesting is the connection here because he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth 
shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, the interesting part is, he says the gates will not prevail against the church. Now, he did not specifically here say that Satan will not come into the church and do these things or, or do... He said gates. Well, what is something, if you have a gate at your house, what is something that a gate does? Keeps a dog in? Or, but the question is, if you have a gate at your house, do I have to worry about your gate coming over to this church and doing anything? How is your gate going to affect me anyways? The only way your gate is going to affect me is if I go over to your house and mess with your gate. Jesus is making a very important analogy and illustration here. The church is not staying within the four walls of the church. The church is full on going out and facing an enemy. And he says, we're basically going towards the gates of hell in the sense of we are going into darkness. He said that we are the light of what? This world. Gates don't go anywhere. They stay there and they swing back and forth. But as we go into this world, guess what? We're facing forces of darkness. Ephesians, we're going to get there in a few, few, day, a few weeks or so, but Ephesians talks about that we face what? Spiritual wickedness in high places. We talk about, he talks about putting on the whole armor of God and all of these things. And we don't wrestle against, he speaks of flesh and blood. Sometimes we think our neighbor is our enemy. Sometimes we think a person sitting next to us in church is our enemy. They are not. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual darkness. We wrestle against an enemy that knows how to infiltrate our minds, that knows how to sometimes make us think things that aren't even true, make us think, well, I can't believe they said that. And sometimes they didn't even say what we thought they said or we misunderstood something and before too long we're mad about something that never even happened. I know. I'm still mad at you, John. But you know... It's just how these things happen. And we wrestle against it. And that's what Jesus says. You know what he's going to say? He's going to give us the authority to bind things on, on earth. He said, if it's bound on earth, it'll be bound. In, you know, we have the authority. We have the ability to get straight to God with the things here and bind them up. We have the ability, whatever is bound on earth, he says, shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth. And we're going to be able to take, the, take these things to God and put, be able to take and put it, because I can't take care of it on my own. But he endued power to these apostles. Initially, we always think of the disciples as just uh, disciples. Disciples are... Students. The disciples, though, were the apostles. The initial apostolic authority was right there among the twelve disciples who became the original apostles. And those apostles had this apostolic authority that was, I mean, they would walk and open blinded eyes. They would walk, I mean, they were the living embodiment of authority. When they spoke, they spoke with the authority that God had given them. I mean, they literally would look at a man who was begging and say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to you. And what did they do? They gave the man the ability to get up and go. And then the man didn't have to beg anymore. Is that better than giving the man silver and gold? Hey, I don't have any money to give to you, but you know what? I'll give you something even better. See, he gave them the power. The power that they had was the power from God to bind things on earth, loose things on earth. These original apostles had something, a gifting from God. 
The reason they could walk into this world, they walked into a dark world and did things that was miraculous. Look at Paul. But turn the world. These 12 men, these men turn the world upside down. When was the last time we saw a church turn the world upside down? We talk about numbers and talk about how big the church is today, but I don't see the church turning the world upside down. Think about it. These men turn the world upside down. And were they perfect? And that's where we get to. Verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem. And He told them that He would suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. Now, I want to tell you something right here. Have you ever listened to a message or listened to somebody speaking and not caught the whole message? You only heard what you wanted to hear or you only caught part of it and you got mad halfway through the message and you tuned out the rest of it? I believe this is what Peter did. Because what did Jesus say? He said He was going to go to uh, Jerusalem. He was going to suffer. He said He was going to be killed. And then he said, what? On the third day, he would be raised. Now, if you caught that whole message, the whole message is, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to be raised. That's the whole message. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter's now, I guess he thinks, well, I've done got one thing right, I can get more things right. And he takes him aside and he says, far be it from you, Lord this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. I'll tell you what Peter heard. He heard Jesus was going to suffer and Jesus was going to die. I don't believe he heard the third part of the message, which was, he would be raised on the third day. Sometimes we catch part of the message, but we miss because we tuned out after we only heard the bad part that we don't catch the good part of what Jesus is going to do. The reason why Jesus didn't want him to tell any man yet is because, like we heard just a minute ago, they didn't fully understand yet. See, part of the, uh, the, the illustration, part of the, uh, the message was they still believed a Messiah was one thing. They didn't, Judas believed the Messiah was going to be a political revolutionist. They still didn't truly know what a Messiah meant. And they still hadn't fully grasped the concept yet that Messiah meant to die for their sins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we're honest, and that's what I love. And that's and that's what it comes down. I love the way that Jesus responds to him. 
And, and when was the other time that Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan? To Satan. At the moment of temptation, when he was in the wilderness. Um, and what was Satan trying to get Jesus to do? Appeal to his fleshly desires. And here, Jesus looks to Peter and he says, Get thee behind me, Satan. It's not that he's calling Peter actually Satan or looking at Peter and saying, You're Satan now. But he's making a strong comparison for what reason? The strong comparison is that Peter, get, you, get, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. You see, the mindset here, and, and this goes to all of our lives, is you are going to encounter people in your life who are going to hinder you from what God wants you to do. Be it far from you to do such a thing. Hey, why would you do that? Don't you know how much time that would take? I mean, you could be doing other things besides doing that. That seems like an awful lot of work. For no reward. No. You, you could spend your time doing other things besides all that time down at the church or all that time doing these things for... I, I don't know why you're always given. And... I mean, Jesus, why are you giving all your time and giving your life? Be it far from you, Lord. Let's just keep walking around the countryside healing people. Be it far from you. And he says, what? You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but you're thinking, what? Of the things of men. We'll always have people in our lives who will, who will be thinking of the things of men. Sometimes, like Jeff said, we'll think of the things of men as well. Whenever we know God may want something for us, and we'll think, God, no, 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 no. And we'll argue with God. Or maybe we'll have somebody else in our life who comes along and kind of argues with us. And they can become a hindrance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we see that um, if you'll remember, the three temptations of Satan were to satisfy the physical needs, which was to command the stones to become bread. Uh, to test God by throwing himself off the highest point of the temple. And then, la and lastly, to worship uh, Satan uh, instead of God. Um, now, we have that uh, in each of those passages, Jesus, or in each of those temptations, Jesus responded with the word of God. Um, here, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And Peter went from in the previous few verses being a rock to now Jesus calls him a hindrance. Think about this. He goes from being the rock to being the stumbling block. How can that be? That is the Christian life. If you think that you'll never be in fact in your life a person that could fail or fall short, then you're sadly mistaken. It's the human fact. Yeah. It wasn't that Peter, I mean, and boy, 
Can you imagine? It says that Peter took him aside, but you know, John, the beloved, was always an eavesdropper. <laughs> you can read passages of that. I am sure that John overheard this. Can you imagine knowing that others probably heard Jesus saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. You know what it's like to be called down by somebody, maybe when you're younger by a parent, or maybe by somebody, a boss over the years. But can you imagine being called down by Jesus in front of others or within earshot of others that He says, Get behind me, Satan. You're nothing but a hindrance to me. You're not even thinking of the things of God. All you're thinking about is the things of men. People said, boy, that pastor's too tough. That pastor preaches too hard. Ooh, can you imagine Jesus saying something like that to you? That seems pretty tough. But Jesus is truthful, and sometimes truth hurts. But sometimes it's truth that sets us back on the right path. And we need truth at times, hard truth, to help us. And Peter gets that. And in our lives, we'll need that as well. Any other thoughts on this passage? I love it. I think it's a great passage of Scripture. All right. Well, thank you guys for this uh, study. I love, I love this study. I love going through it. Uh, I'm enjoying uh, each week. And, uh, but uh, we'll uh, look forward to Sunday. Um, don't forget to bring uh, the flower uh, Sunday and uh, for a memorial service. Uh, it is Memorial Day weekend. A lot of people will be traveling, I know, so remember those. And um, but um, all right. We'll go ahead and close tonight in a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we do thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this time of service this evening. I ask that you would uh, be with us as we go our separate ways this evening. Uh, bless the remainder of our week and each one. Uh, those that uh, have appointments and tests upcoming, we pray that you would uh, watch over them and uh, uh, prepare the way and I ask that uh, you would uh, just work in each and every situation and those that are healing I pray that you would uh, give them a speedy recovery uh, we thank you so very much for uh, the opportunity to learn from your word and we'll give you thanks for all that you continue to do in your son's name Amen